Mr. President, members of the opposition and Western politicians say that you are the main obstacle for peace in Syria. Would you be ready to step down as president if this could bring peace to your country and stop the bloodshed? The uh, president uh, shouldn't uh, run away from challenge, and we have national challenge now uh, in Syria. So the president shouldn't escape the situation. Uh, but from uh, the other side, uh, you can stay as president, you can stay in this position only when you have the public support. So uh, answering this question should be a public answer by the Syrian people, by the election, not by the president. I can nominate myself, I can run for the election or not run. But to leave or not to leave, this is uh, about the Syrian people. Do you think that you still have a majority behind you in your country? Uh, if, I have, uh, the, if I don't have the public support, how could I stay in this position? The United States is against me, the West is against me, many regional power and countries are against me. So, and the people are against, uh, the people against me, so how can I stay in this position? So the answer is, of course, I still have uh, public support. How much, what the percentage, this is another question. I don't have numbers now. But of course, to stay in this position, in this situation, you must have public support. I've been to some of the demonstrations, even in Homs, mm -hmm. in peaceful demonstrations. Isn't it legitimate if people demand for more freedom, more democracy, and less power in the hands of one family, less power in the hands of secret services? Let's correct the question first to have the correct uh, answer. Uh, we don't have power in the hand of a family. In Syria we have state, we have institutions, maybe not the ideal institutions, but we don't have family to run the country. So we have a state. This is uh, first of all. Uh, so now we can answer the first part. Of course they have the right. They have legitimate right, whether they are demonstrators or not. Not only demonstrators ask for freedom. Actually, the majority of the people who ask for uh, reform, political reform, not freedom. We have freedom, but not the ideal freedom. But the reform, let's say, to have more participation in the, in the power, in the government, in everything else uh, in, in their country. This is legitimate, but the majority are not in the demonstrations. You have people uh, who demonstrated and you have not, but this is legitimate. A question that everybody is asking in the Western countries, in your country, who has killed the thousands of civilians who died in this conflict? The opposition blames you. Hmm. Uh, if you want to know who uh, killed, you have first to know who has been killed. We cannot tell about the criminal without knowing about the victims. Those victims that you're talking about, the majority of them are government supporters. So how can, can you be the criminal and the victim at the same time? The majority are people who support the government and large part of the others uh, are innocent people who have been killed by different uh, groups in Syria. Would you admit that some of these or a certain percentage of these innocent civilians has been killed by your security forces, a certain percentage? No, you don't have, because you have investigation committee about all the crimes that happened in Syria. But from the list that we have, from the names that we have, the highest percentage people who are killed by gangs in different, uh, different uh, kind of gangs, whether Al-Qaeda, whether extremists, or outlaws, uh, people who escaped uh, the, the, the police for, for, uh, for years. So you say that the rebels whom you call terrorists have killed more civilians than the security forces? Not really. They killed more security and soldiers maybe than civilians. I'm talking about the supporters. But if we, about the supporters. If we talk only about the civilians, did the rebels kill more civilians than the security forces? Or did the security forces kill more civilians? Yeah, that's what I mean. If you talk about the support of the government, the victims from the security and the army are more than the civilians. You said there are investigations against those members of the security forces who might have killed yeah. innocent civilians. Mm -hmm. Have some of them been punished? Yeah, of course. They were detained in prisons. In prison. They've been under, under, they are subjected to trial now, like any other crime. Who has committed the massacre of Hula, in which more than 100 people were brutally murdered, among them many children? Yeah. Uh, gangs came in hundreds from outside the city, not from inside the city, and they attacked the city. And they attacked the law enforcement uh, forces unit inside the city. And then they killed 
many families, and as you mentioned, children and women. Uh, and actually, those families that's been killed, they are uh, government supporters, not opposition. I was told by somebody who lives in Hula and who lost members of his family. He told me that the killers were army uniforms. Why yeah. did they wear army uniforms? Just to accuse uh, our government. That happened many times. They committed a crime, they uh, published videos, fake videos, and they wear the soldier uniform, our army uniform, in order to say this is the army. So it's been killing the people in Syria. You say this is a strategy of the rebels? Yeah, from the very beginning. Yeah, yeah, they do it all the time. Not only in Hola, in many places. Who are these rebels whom you call terrorists? They are a mixture, they are amalgam of uh, Al-Qaeda, other extremists, not necessarily Al-Qaeda, and outlaws who escaped the police for years, mainly smuggling uh, drugs from Europe to the Gulf. Uh, Area and others who were who were sentenced in different sentences. So it's a mixture of different things. How many rebels are fighting against your government? You don't have number, but you can talk about thousands. Twenty, thirty. You can. You cannot tell. I wouldn't give you any number if not precise. Would you say that all these rebels are terrorists? It depends on the act. If they attack people and burn and destroy, of course this is terrorism by the law. But you have people who are implicated without being criminals. In different, for different reasons, sometimes for financial reasons, they, they pay them money, sometimes under threat, and sometimes uh, for certain illusions and delusions. So not all of them are terrorists. That's why we absolve many of them when they give up their arm, armaments. Okay. Did you capture some of the Al-Qaeda fighters you were talking about? Yeah, yeah. we caught many, tens, Good. tens of them. From which countries? I think from uh, maybe Tunisian and Libyans, I think. Could I meet one of them? Yes, you can. With a translator? Alone? Yeah, of course. What is the role of the United States in this conflict? It's part of the conflict. They, give, uh, they offer the umbrella and uh, political support to those gangs to create destability or to destabilize Syria. You say the United States is politically supporting the rebels. Yes. Is that correct? Yeah, exactly. And you say these rebels whom you call terrorists kill yeah. civilians. This means you are accusing the American government of being at least partly responsible for the killing of innocent Syrian civilians. Is that correct? Of course, exactly. As long as you offer any kind of support to terrorists, you are a partner. Whether you send them armament or money or uh, public support, political support in the United Nations, anywhere, any kind of support. This is implication. You know that Western politicians see the situation differently. Yeah. And they are discussing a military intervention in Syria. How would you react? Would you retaliate against Western countries? No, it's not about the retaliation. It's about defending our country. Our priority is to defend our country, not to retaliate to anyone. This is our duty and this is our aim. And you're prepared for such an attack? Whether you're prepared or not, you're going to defend your country. But you have to be prepared. If for you the United States is part of the problem, why don't you negotiate with them? Why don't you invite Mrs. Hillary Clinton to Damascus? Why don't you make hmm. the first step? We never closed our doors in front of any country in this world and any official, as long as they want to help in solving the problem in Syria providing that they are serious and honest. Uh, but they close their doors, so we don't have any problem. We always uh, announce publicly that we are ready for any kind of help or dialogue. You would be ready for a dialogue with Mrs. Hillary Clinton? You would be ready to walk with her through these, the streets of Damascus to show her the hospitals, to show her the situation in the city? As I said, we don't close the door in, uh, in front of everyone, including the Americans or any other one. It's not particularly. Mrs. Clinton or any other American official. Of course, we don't have problem. I did, we did it many times with others to walk in the streets, as you mentioned, and mm -hmm. we'll do it again. We don't have problem, of course. Let's come to the internal situations. Are negotiations with the different opposition groups still a realistic option, or do you think you have to fight this conflict out till the bitter end? Dialogue is a strategic option. 
whatever you do, whatever other option you have, you need a dialogue. At least to make sure that you can do something peacefully. But as long as you have terrorism, and as long as the dialogue didn't work, you have to fight the terrorism. You cannot keep just making dialogue while they are killing your people and your army. But you could have a dialogue with those who yeah. are not terrorists. We had dialogue last summer and we kept inviting them. Some of them accepted the invitation and they made dialogue and they participated in the elections in the parliament and they had some seats in the parliament and they have portfolios in the recent government but they last week. But they got only 2% in the last elections. Yeah, this is not our fault. We don't have to offer them the percentage. <laughs> so we don't create the government. Would you be ready to talk also to the opposition in exile? Yeah, we, and we know that. We said we are ready to talk to anyone. Would you be ready to discuss and negotiate also with rebels if they lay their weapons down? Definitely, and we did, and we absorbed them, and they, some of them... Uh, live normal life now. They don't have any problem. You would be ready to talk to everybody if he, is, he lays his weapons down? Of course. If, if, even before, we started talking before they laid down their weapons in order to, to get that result. What about the Kofi Annan plan? Mm -hmm. has, has it failed? No, it shouldn't fail. And Kofi Annan uh, uh, is doing uh, so far difficult but good job. We know that he has many obstacles, but it shouldn't fail. This what plan is, is a very good plan. What is his main obstacle? The main obstacle that many countries didn't want it to succeed. So they offer po uh, political support and they still send armaments and send money to terrorists in Syria. They wanted to fail this way. Who sends the weapons to your country? Who is the country who is supporting the rebels most? If, you don't have, if I don't have evidence, concrete evidences, I will tell you what the uh, indications. Those countries announced publicly that they're going to support those, those terrorists, mainly the uh, Minister of Foreign Affairs of Saudi Arabia and his uh, uh, counterpart in Qatar. They announced publicly they're going to support them. Uh, this is regarding the armaments. Uh, Turkey, I think, uh, offer logistic support for smuggling. In the United States? United States mainly so far, what we know so far, that they offer political support. Means of communication also? We have some information about this, but I didn't mention it because we don't have concrete evidence to, to show it to you. What about Kofi Annan's plan for a, unite, a united government, for a unity government, for a government formed by the different groups? with the opposition groups, with Ba'ath Party members. Yeah, you're talking about uh, the Geneva Conference now. His, his plan for a unity government, yes. Yeah, we, we talked about it in Syria. Now we have a unity government where you have the opposition that participated in the parliament, uh, participated in this government. But you should have criteria. Well, how do you define opposition? You, have, um, you may have tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, or millions. Do you, uh, do you, could they participate? You need, the, I mean, this kind of government, the democracy uh, needs uh, uh, these criteria and needs mechanism. For me, the mechanism is the elections. If you represent the people, you go to the election, you run the elections, you win seats, you can come to the government. While if you're only opposition, but you don't have any seat in the parliament, who do you pre represent, yourself? When are the next elections? Which elections? Yeah, you, you were talking about the election, the next election. No, I'm talking about the parliamentarian. Election. I'm talking about the parliamentarian. It was uh, only yeah, two, months, months two months ago. ago. Yeah. Or month ago but, for example, the opposition in exile didn't participate in these elections. Would you accept members of the opposition in exile to participate in an interim, let's call an interim government? If they can comply with our rules, with our laws, they not participated in criminal acts or asking the NATO or any other country to attack Syria, which is against our law, they have the right to participate. We don't have problem. Many of the opposition in Syria, inside Syria, participated. Why to ban the opposition outside from this participation? We don't have any reason as government. A man like Galyun or he's the, the, he's the president now of the National Council, you would be ready to accept them? It's not about the names or the position, it's about the principles. 
we have to go back to the file. Does he have anything legally to ban him from being part of these elections or not? So this implies on everyone. So it's not about names. Mr. President, when you think about what happened to the leaders of Egypt and Libya, hmm. when you remember the pictures that we all have seen on TV, hmm. aren't you scared for your family, your wife, your little children? No, if I want to describe two different uh, situations you're talking about, uh, describing what happened to Al-Qazafi, this is uh, savage. This is crime. Whatever he did, whatever he was, nobody in the world can accept what happened to kill somebody like this. What happened to Mubarak is different. It's a trial. Uh, any citizen, when he watches a trial on TV, he would think that I don't want to be in that position. So the answer is don't do like them, don't do like him. But to compare or to be scared, you have to, I mean, to be scared, you have to compare. Do we have something in common? No, it's a completely different situation. What's happening in Egypt is different from what's happening in Syria. The historical context is different. The social fabric is different. And our policy was always different. So what's in common? You cannot compare. So yeah. you cannot feel scared. <laughs> but you, yeah, but maybe you feel sorry or pity or whatever. But nevertheless, you have a hard opposition. You have a... You have hard fighting rebels and you know what these rebels want to do. So yeah. my question, I repeat it, aren't you scared for your family? Uh, the most important thing is that when you do things that should be in comply with your convictions. This is where you can feel relaxed, you don't scare, because the people can disagree with you, but at least trust you that you are doing something for the interest of your country. When you defend your country, why to be scared? When you do something to protect the people, why, why to be scared? You may say that you have uh, uh, thousands of uh, victims, what if you have uh, hundreds of thousands of victims? So that's what's supposed to be in Syria. But in the end, what is your solution for this conflict in this country? And I ask again yeah. my question, do you fear or do you think you have to fight this conflict out till the bitter end? I repeat it. We have two axes of the solution. The first one, you have to fight terrorism. There is no question about fighting terrorists. Nowhere in the world. What would you do if somebody killed civilians? kill innocent people, kill children, These and kill your soldiers, yeah. and kill the soldiers, and kill the police, and kill anyone. You have to fight with him if he's not ready for dialogue, and that's what we've been seeing so far. The other axe is to make dialogue with different components, political components, and at the same time to have reform, to participate everyone, and the people will, define, will decide who, uh, who should be our representative, or I mean the people's representative, through the ballot box. Could these was. reforms come a little bit faster? It's subjective uh, things. You think it's faster, I think it's slower. But at the end, the principle is that you do as fast as you can without paying a uh, heavy price or without having a lot of side effects. So as fast as possible, and that's not related to me or to the government or to the state, that's related to the objective uh, circumstances in Syria. Mr. President, our time is running out. Where would you like to see your country in two years? What is your vision for Syria? I would like to see it in every year in prosperity. Prosperity means better economy, uh, uh, better uh, in every aspect, culturally and whatever, but that needs security. Without security, you cannot dream about prosperity. That's what, how I see it. Mr. President, thank you very much for this interview. Thanks for you. Good luck for your country, and especially peace, freedom, and democracy. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Thank you.